going to lead us in a study this morning. Put on Christ. Put on Christ. And he'll tell you his sad plight here in a second. <laughs> well, good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. Seems I'm just wearing out. I uh, went for a little walk Wednesday morning. Tuesday night I went to Bible study as usual. Wednesday morning I, my knee was bothering me a little bit. And since I'd only walked once in two weeks, I knew I, what I needed was a nice, a nice good walk to get me back in, in my normal routine. I made it down to the church. I'm thinking, boy, I'm not even going to make it up to Green Street. I better head back home. By the time I got to the house, the garage door was open and I was hopping to get a hold of Sherry's old crutches. And it uh, seems I have a torn meniscus. At least that's, I had to go to three doctors for them each to say, it's a torn meniscus. Yeah, it's a torn meniscus, but we got to have a MRI for sure. So I had to go to three of them before one of them would put in a thing so I could have an MRI. So I'm still waiting for that appointment. But they don't seem to have much much question about what it is. Bruce, you can uh, take off your mask. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, with that, we're, we're going to have a study this morning. Last week, we finished up the second half of the uh, parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. And Brother Dennis and I differed in our views on what all uh, is, is in this parable. We both see the first eight verses as combining with the previous two parables telling the chief priests and Pharisees and the nation of Israel as a whole, the nation had blown it. They had rejected God's invitation to be his bride and thereby proved and declared themselves unworthy of getting an invitation to the wedding. Now at verses 9 to 14, we, we, we differ. Um, it seems to me that the Israelites as a nation and the chief priests and Pharisees to whom Jesus is addressing his parables are, are, are finished when the king sends out his armies and destroys those murderers and burned up their city. The second set of invitations I see as the gospel going out, out to all, the good and the bad, and does not go out to the nation of Israel as a whole, but it only gets out and is, is accepted and received by individuals, which of course include Jews, some of them anyways. Brother Dennis, if I understand right, feels the whole parable has only to do with the nation of Israel blowing it, and that uh, I may be ignoring Vine's warning, which we talked about, about straying from the big picture when I see a warning to the church. But my fear of snoozing Christians who fail to realize that there is an inheritance to be claimed and a race to be run, that accepting salvation through faith in Jesus is just the start of the work and the course to be run. We agree upon that. We agree that the wedding garments that one needs to have on as, be, as depicted in the parable to attend the wedding feast is Christ's righteousness, which the nation of Israel as a whole rejects even today. These are the important points from the parable that I hope to use to help make my case that we need to be not just sitting and waiting for our Lord's return, but that we are to be about the good works for which Christ has grabbed hold of us. Those good works that God has prepared for us to do and that there are eternal consequences involved. Not eternal torment, but the grave forfeiture of our inheritance which God has given us. If we fail to run or run lawfully, and it will result in weeping and gnashing of teeth. We agree on these facts, but 
not necessarily that this this parable supports that 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 uh, that particular fact. Do I have that mostly right, Brother Dennis? Pretty close. Okay. So just so that um, if it was confusing as to where we we differed on the on the strong points that we're going to touch today, we are in agreement. So at the very end of the service, we finally got to the question of, of what are the wedding garments that Sister Leah had asked a couple weeks ago about and Brother Jack asked last week. And we went to Revelation 19, 7 to 9, and there it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Again, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So we have the wife, the bride, hasn't just been sitting at, at home, she's made herself ready. And it was granted to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. Let me suggest that the bright, clean white garments that seem to always be worn when messengers of God come and speak, and speak for God, they represent the righteousness and holiness of God. For the, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. As Brother Dennis pointed out last week, this may well be referred to the oft forgotten or left out verse 10 of Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Uh, nearly all love to quote verses 8 and 9, as do I. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we say amen to that. But Apostle Paul is not finished. As he continues, he tells us why God has given us this free gift of salvation. And verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Are we to think that whether we do these good works or not makes no difference? Does it matter to our Heavenly Father whether our faith is dead or is alive? Quoted far less often in Ephesians 1, 8, and 9, but equally important and equally true are these words of James. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James 1, 22. Those who hear and know the word and fail to live them and declare that they have it made deceiving themselves. And that deception is being sent out from many, many a church today. Once saved, always saved. But there's much work to be done. And it matters. James also says in the next chapter, thus also faith by itself, if if it does not have works, it's dead. Those may be fighting words to many who wish to cling only to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But we must consider all of Scripture and it all fits together. We can't just ignore and tear out the pages we don't like or 
decide we like this one better than that one, so we'll just stay with this. You want to know what God's plans are, you've got to take the whole plan. You've got to see the whole big picture. We are not to be just acceptors of the word, but doers. The righteous acts of the saints are the good works which God has prepared beforehand for us to do. So how do good works become righteous acts of the saints? Last week we quoted Romans 3.10 that there are none righteous, not even one. So how can an unrighteous saint do righteous acts? Let's go back to James, chapter 2, verses 19 to 24. There, there James writes, You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons they tremble. But do you know, O oh foolish man, writes James, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You know, God had made the promise to Abraham that through thee and thy seed all peoples of the earth would be blessed. Before, I, before Isaac was born. Right? Remember he made the covenant with, with Abraham? And now turn with me to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. If somebody would, would read for us verses 11 through 18. Genesis 22, 11 through 18. Now you know you know this um, event well. The, 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 the Isaac, the son of promise, was uh, at 100 years old, was, was given to Abraham, and then at a, a certain age, Abraham is told to take and sacrifice Isaac to God. Okay. Remember the promise is that it will be through the seed of Abraham. So it has to come through Isaac. Isaac has no children at this point. Okay. So it, it, we would just ask if you speak into the microphone that you wear a mask. Um, for, for, for protection. So with, with, with some, who would like to read for this morning? Brother Dennis, thank you. Genesis 22, 11 through 18. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Uh, verse 11? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and he said, here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the, mount of, in the mount of the Lord 
it will be provided. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Again, God had made the promise to Isaac before Isaac was born. By works, Abraham's faith and belief in God is made perfect. It was completed. Okay? Because Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him as righteousness. And that's the point we want to we wanna make here. That after he was faithful and did the works, proving his, 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 his belief and faith in God, okay? I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you, multiplying, I will multiply. And James's point is, it wasn't just that Abraham believed God, but he really believed God to the point where he would even sacrifice the son of promise. So by works, Abraham's faith and belief in God is made perfect or complete. And God confirms his covenant with Abraham. God declares the good works of the saints as righteous acts when it is done in faith in Jesus Christ. Again, we read this last week, but Paul writes in Philippians 3, 9, that he wants to be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Thus, we offer that the wedding garments represent Christ's righteousness. So are there questions or comments that you'd like to make on the, on the wedding garments being Christ's righteousness? We, it was really right at the end of the service last week. We didn't get a chance to much to uh, discuss it. Any, anybody have any, any comments or questions you'd like to make? Okay, so our, our question this week is, how do we get and put on Christ's righteousness? How or where do we get and how do we put on Christ's righteousness? Now that we have defined that as the wedding garments, Anybody have a thought? Yes, Tim. Go ahead. Like the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians? The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Very good. Very good. We are going there. We are going there. Yeah. Brother Dennis, down front here. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I think a, a good chapter to look at is Colossians 3. Where I think the King James even uses the words clothe, clothe yourself with these things. And uh, you probably should look at that before, uh, at some point. Okay, why don't we go there, go there now. Colossians 3. is where it starts talking about clothing yourself but the first four verses are really important to understand the foundation for which you want to clothe yourself you 
we know it for the <laughs> Does anybody have a King James? I've got, got the new King James. Does he use cloak? In, in. in verse 5 uh, through 7. Okay, Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank you. Thank you. That that that's a nice that's a nice list. Um, you will as you read through those, holy, beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. When we go to uh, the fruit of the spirit, you will hear many of these same same attributes. Okay? That we're, we're told, we're told several times that, that, that this is this is how we're, we're to clothe ourselves. Yes, Diane. Um, also, the armor of God. If we put on the armor of God, because one of them is breastplate of righteousness. Right. So, yeah. Co correct. That that's part of, of, of your clothe, clothing is, is going to be the armor of God as, as, as your your protection. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Bruce, I might add that verse 16 of chapter 3 is, is the key verse because you can't really know how to do these things unless you let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Because when you can do that, then you can wisely teach and admonish one another with hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, yeah, with the hearts of thanks and thankfulness. You know, all that comes from uh, the word of God that goes in us. The Holy Spirit works for that Word of God, and that's what comes out of us as it works through us. Very good. And, 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 and this is this is part of putting putting on Christ. Okay, is allowing the Holy Spirit, because these these beautiful attributes that we've just read about here in Colossians three, and we'll read about in the fruit of the Spirit. They are the attributes of Jesus. They aren't ours. Some may be blessed with one or two, okay? but to have them all only comes through knowing Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you and the experiences that God brings in your life. Okay, Allow God to do his work, your work, his workmanship. Allowing God to do His work, and He'll do it through His His Spirit in you. Okay, these are not things that we have a little bit of, and we're going to make a little bit better. Okay, you want to abound in these things, okay? and that takes time, and that takes part of our our 
putting on Christ. Galatians 3, 26, 27, Paul says, So you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So in baptism, we die to self, we give up our own self-will, that leads to sin and death, and taking off these old clothes and recognizing that we cannot save ourselves with these old clothes on, and that we are in deep trouble, that we are in need of a Savior. That's why we get baptized into Christ. We understand our dire condition. There is only one anyone can go to and be saved from their sinful self. In baptism, we acknowledge this singular Savior as our Lord Jesus Christ. And we throw off the old man and his clothes and we put on Christ. We want Christ to live through us. We want to live for Christ. That's what baptism is all about. We're not then a better version of the old man, but we're a new creation. Given the Spirit of God, we begin a whole new life. And once again, this is not the finish line. This is not the finish line. It is but the beginning of our whole new life. Our sins are forgiven. We have a clean slate, but we need to allow God's Spirit to mature and make that new babe into the likeness of the one who saved us. The battle begins each morning. As the old clothes somehow are still in the closet, that comes as a surprise to many. I know it did to me. I mean, I made my declaration and I was baptized and I thought, boy, oh boy, I'm a new person. And the next morning I got up and I'm ugly and, and I'm grumpy and I'm thinking, what, what happened? Yeah. What, what happened? Somehow that old man stays in the closet. And that old man somehow seems to jump to the front of the line every morning. And we need to reject and repel him each day, many times per day, and put on Christ. Get off those old man clothes and put on Christ, the new man. So what does it mean? How, how do we recognize when we are others have or are putting on Christ and we just heard a nice list in Colossians 3 when we're putting on Christ we put on Christ's sentiments Christ's opinion okay. well brother Bruce what, what, what do you think who cares what are my opinions Okay? We're interested in Christ's opinions. Okay? And hopefully, with time, all my opinions will become Christ's opinions. So, if I can say, I have no opinions of my own, that would be a great day. And I'll stay out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> We're dead. Right? We have died to ourselves and our own opinions. We want to know what Christ's opinions are. Christ's characteristics, his traits. We have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that comes from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. We're new men. We have a new language. We 
we have new understanding. Okay. One of the things we need to learn is to quit mixing the two. Okay. Death, death two hours, bring on Christ. That's putting, that is putting on Christ. You know, we're, we're to continue to grow in Christ. We need to keep updating our clothes to allow our growth. Apostle Peter gives us kind of a recipe for, for growth in Christ. He says, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you don't have a little bit. They're yours and they are bound. They're growing. Okay, you're watering. They're growing. They are bound. You will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his sins. James says, deceive yourself. Short-sighted to blindness. Does it matter if you are unfruitful in your knowledge of Jesus Christ? You know, you've accepted him. I'm saved. Okay. I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back. I hope you're not just sitting and waiting for Jesus to come back. There's works to be done. Matthew 21, 43, which is from one of the uh, parables that Dennis had, was referring to last week. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. This Jesus said to the nation of Israel, And if the nation to whom it is given does not produce fruit, what happens to them? It was taken away from Israel because they didn't produce fruit. And it's given to us. And we sit on it and produce no fruit. What should we expect will happen? You're different? I don't think so. I don't think so. Does this sound like you're finished and just waiting for Christ's return? Not only must we know these things, but we must live them to produce the fruit required. We're not to remain in diapers. Diapers are not the wedding garments. We've been cleansed of our sins to produce fruit. And that fruit first, as Brother Dennis was pointing to, must begin within us. It's not going to be handed out and given out to those around us if it's not in us. It has to be produced within us. The fruit of the Spirit, listed in Galatians 5, is the Christ-likeness that we are to put on. Every time we go there, somebody will always correctly, and this group will always point out, those are the attributes of Jesus. And that's right. That's where we're going. That's the goal. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It sounds very familiar to Colossians 3, does it not? Gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. This fruit must be growing constantly within it. And from out of this new creation, it reaches out and it touches all who are around us. 
Ephesians 4, 24 says, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Putting on Christ. Putting on Christ's righteousness. is putting on God's holiness. That seems a mighty high bar, and it certainly is. And that's why you've got to have the, have, have the Holy Spirit to get you there. Okay? Questions or comments? Dennis? In that second Peter list that you just um, read for us, love the last verse of 11 for in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you the gates will be opened wide you know if you're if you're doing these things you know you're not going to get into the crack of the door you know which I, I think a lot of people are going to wind up having to do just, just get me through <laughs> just know? get me in uh, he says you do these things you know we'll open the gates wide and welcome you in you, you, you have these, you keep building on them, you keep running to your last breath. And remember, it's God doing the work in you. God's going to finish it. God's going to complete it. That which he has begun in you, there's only one way that you don't finish and you don't complete it, and that's if you stop God from doing that work in you. Brother Andrew used to always tell me, Bruce, get out of the way. Get out of the way. Let God, you're trying to do everything yourself. Get out of the way. Let God work. Let God work. Let God do it. Okay? But you got to be out there. you gotta, you got to be running. Thank you, Dennis. Any other thoughts or comments on putting on Christ? Well, I have, I was going to look at, uh, I don't think we have enough, enough time to, to do it all, but in, in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, at Corinth, for I am jealous of you with godly jealousy for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ what is a chaste virgin to Christ anyone have a thought have you ever, ever thought about that brother Dennis somebody who's spiritually pure uh, he's talking about spiritual adultery. Absolutely. You know, that uh, when you start messing with uh, other ways of salvation, other gospels that isn't in this gospel, uh, that's what he was so mad at them about. Was You know, I, I founded this church on the principles of truth. And, uh, and now you've let these uh, hooligans come in and, and, and uh, they're preaching another gospel and you think it's okay. You know? Yeah. You're, you're, you don't know it. You're, you're committing a spiritual adultery and you don't even know it. And, and so, you know, I can see why he's very upset. You know, and he says, that's, the, that's how Satan works. Don't you see the, 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 you know, the workings of Satan right in your midst? You, you can't. You're blind to it. That's why he's the great deceiver. And his, his concern is that they will be so easily moved from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay? The gospel message, deep as it is, is a simple message. It needs to be accepted as a simple message. And you start putting all these other things into it, then you're getting away from the simplicity that is Christ. 
And our faith is in Jesus Christ. Not in a church, not in a, any denomination, not in any group, or any other thing. Your dedication, you've given your life not to the CBF. You haven't been baptized into CBF. You've been baptized into Christ. A chaste virgin. You know, one of the one of in our bylaws, one of the aspects that can be used for removal of an elder is a divergence of the doctrines that we've been built on, because we believe we built them on the truth of Scripture, and so it's really that this congregation. This ecclesia's responsibility that if anybody gets up there and starts speaking uh, something that's divergent from that, and they hold an office in this church, uh, it is our job to, to um, I don't want to say punish, it's, uh, it's our job correct to, to correct. Yeah, correct is yeah, better, much better word. Yeah, is to correct and, and admonish, uh, to go back on the straight. And narrow path. Defend the truth. Yep. Defend the truth. Um, one, one of the, the, the thoughts is that this chaste virgin is, is, is kind of redundant. And Paul isn't known to redundancy. Okay. And, and I, I, I read a an article in, in the Herald that, that explains this chaste virgin, virgin that I want to I want to share with you. We're almost out of time, so um, to say the least, none of us comes with spiritual virginity and holiness naturally. In one Corinthians six, after listing a hefty array of big sins. Paul says, and such were some of you. And brethren, such were some of us. And Paul says, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Now, this has to make a difference in this, brethren. Right? We can't be washed, sanctified, and justified and just remain the same old way we always were, the old man we always were. I quote now from the Herald Magazine article. It is this justification which makes us virgins. And it is the subsequent washing and sanctifying that maintains that virginity. Thus, when Paul speaks of us as virgins, he is referring to our justified sinlessness and purity. And when he speaks of chaste virgins, he is talking about the maintaining of that purity through washing and sanctification. Unquote. We are not innocent of committing sin. Our sins are forgiven through our faith in Christ and the judge has ruled ruled as justified. Thus the author of the article when he says our justified sinlessness or purity is just as Abraham believed God and he was considered righteous Accounted righteous. We're, we're not accounted sinless. Our sins are forgiven. And we have been declared justified by God. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that she should be holy and without blemish. Thus, the chaste virgin is a justified virgin who continually allows Christ to wash and purify them through the washing of the Word. Any questions or, 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 or comments? We have just a couple minutes. Okay. Well, this ends this month for me. Next week, Brother Rich will be serving us on the fifth Sunday of the month. And I pray that none of us fall to pray to Satan's scheme of rocking us all to sleep by making us feel that once we are saved, we have nothing to do but wait for Christ's return. The inheritance that is being held for us to claim is not available to angels. It is available to us and Satan hates us for it. As Brother Pat said last night, if you heard it. Because that inheritance should have been his, he sees. And he wants to deny everybody he can from claiming what he knows would have been his had he been faithful. So run, brethren. Run to your last breath. Run lawfully and God will finish the work he has begun in you. If you will believe and run, you cannot fail, for God cannot fail. God will have his way. Go to Dennis. Thank you, Brother Bruce. continue to keep ourselves, you know, when the Bible uses uh, naked in Revelation, you know, it, it's not literal, it's, he's talking spiritually, and he's referring to, you know, we put on the clothing of Jesus, and, and God doesn't want to find us on that day naked, which means without the clothing of Jesus. Wonderful. Uh, we're going to close with I Am Resolved. I ask you to stand and ask Brother Bruce to close in prayer.
prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come rejoicing before you this morning in the merit of the precious shed blood of thy dear Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come rejoicing in the salvation which our Lord has purchased for us and which you give freely to us. We pray now that we have seared in our memories not only Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but verse 10 also. That we not forget your purpose in giving us this free gift. That our faith may never be dead. That we will put on our energies, gifts, and talents into those good works that you have prepared for us to do. And Father, we know that the list is so lofty that only through your Spirit and the work of your Spirit in us can we ever hope to accomplish such things. Father, we pray that we not slumber and fail to claim that glorious inheritance by not running for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Father, be with us all, we pray. We ask your continued blessings and mercies upon Sherry and her mother Janie in these last days. We pray for the Martin family and their recent loss, Father, that you will comfort them and they will be comforted by knowing your promises, sure promises in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that Carol sleeps now and all her trials are over for now. And we pray that her family will be encouraged by knowing that indeed they will see her once again. So Father, these things we ask all in the name and the merit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for your eternal honor and glory. Amen. 